What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 39th episode of Weekend Review. My name is Sean, and on this week's show, we're going to talk about one movie, one game, and two limited edition items. We'll start on the movie side this week with The Bad Times at the El Royale, which is a movie I've been looking forward to for a while. I think the El Royale Hotel provides a fantastic and fascinating uh, setting for this particular movie. It's half set in Nevada and half of it in California, and the line goes right down the middle of the hotel, so you have the option to stay in the California rooms, which are a dollar more, or the Nevada rooms, and I thought that was just super interesting. There weren't really any differences other than that, except for I don't think you could drink on one side of the hotel but I mean aside from that like kind of that aesthetic detail I don't think it really factored much into the plot but it was still an interesting interesting set nonetheless I thought that John Hamm and Cynthia Ervo were the two best performances and characters of the movie I really like John Hamm in pretty much anything I love him on uh, 30 Rock where he plays a, a recurring a brief recurring role throughout the series and I really liked him in Baby Driver as well he can do comedy or drama doesn't really matter I'm in for it. He probably is better as a comedic actor, but I actually like him in dramatic roles as well. Cynthia Ervo, who I have not heard of until now, and looking at her uh, filmography on the movie app that I was looking at, she'd only been in two movies that had been released, and a third one, Widows, coming up, which I'm very, very excited about. So we'll see her again very shortly. Their characters were the most interesting uh, interesting bits, and they're kind of polar opposites. One of them's a little more mysterious in John Hamm's character, and Cynthia Ervo's character is kind of that classic, like, wrong place at the wrong time sort of thing. And I, I just, I really liked her character and performance. The first hour and 45 minutes of this movie are superb. The movie feels very meticulously put together. As a person whose complaint of Mission Impossible 6 was that the time didn't matter at the end of the movie, when it's like, we have 15 minutes to defuse the bomb, and that goes on for like 45 minutes, this movie felt like it was really paying attention to how much time things took and the best way I can think to explain this is if three characters are in one room and that series or that sequence of events is happening and that sequence takes three minutes and 45 seconds everybody else only has three minutes and 45 seconds to finish their conversation or to get from point a to point b and there was only one time where the movie felt like it was slowing down or extending the time to get characters from one point to another and it was just a sequence where two characters are walking down like a hallway and it was just weird that they kept stopping like they'd walk a little bit stop have a conversation walk a little bit further stop and have a conversation walk a little bit further and that was the only time that it felt kind of out of place and it was like you're buying your time everything else felt fantastic and it felt like you could guess the pacing of it and you understand that this three minutes and 45 seconds at the end of that time or something's going to happen and this person needs to get out of the way then it was just something that I really noticed and I really, really liked. That being said, this movie is about 20 minutes too long. There is a character that shows up. It's Chris Hemsworth's character. And initially when he shows up, he's actually like pretty interesting and different and like kind of weird in a way that's intriguing. But he very quickly becomes one note. And the biggest problem with this is when this, when Chris Hemsworth character shows up towards the end of the movie... All the pieces are finally falling into place. The momentum is really, really starting to build towards, you know, like a big climactic conclusion. And that gets ground to a halt for way too long. And he spends all this time talking. And it's like, just shut up. Like, please stop. Can we do this a little bit, a little bit quicker? Just pick up the pace a little bit. It happens a second time where they finally build the momentum back up. Things go crazy. All hell breaks loose. And then some character gets a backstory and grinds it to a halt again. It's a super weird like 20 to 25 minute chunk towards the end of the last like 45 minutes or so that really left a bad taste in my mouth. It's a movie that I was totally, totally like in love with from the the opening sequence when Jeff Bridges meets Cynthia Ervo and they have like a humorous back and forth and then John Hamm comes in and he's bouncing off and the dialogue's interesting and I'm engaged in all the conversations and I like the characters for the most part and I like the performances and the way it's put together and then it just it gets a wrench thrown in the system that doesn't feel super necessary and it's I don't know it's just it's weird it's it's weird how interesting he starts and how one note he becomes and how quickly that happens Chris Hemsworth characters what I'm referring to and it's super frustrating 
Also, I'd like to give a brief shout out to the lady who was three seats to my left. Uh, there were two times where there was like a sudden noise, like startling. And she like yelled at one of them and like bounced out of her seat, like cheeks left the seat. She was so startled by what happened. So uh, shout out to her. Overall, I quite like this movie. If it wasn't for that messy 25 minutes towards the last third of the movie, I'd actually be recommending this movie a lot higher. I think that first hour and 45 minutes or so, and that's a rough time guesstimate, by the way. That's not like an exact number. Um, I think that first hour and 45 minute chunk is absolutely superb and fantastic. If you're a fan of the noir genre, check it out. If you like the trailers for it, it's definitely worth seeing. Our game this week comes to us in the form of Crayola Scoot, and this has a little bit of an interesting backstory uh, to it. I actually was provided a code by the, the publisher Outright Games to have early access to this particular game, um, which is awesome. So thank you to Outright Games for providing that. In addition to reviewing it on this particular show, we actually made a Let's Play. Ashley and I made a Let's Play, and that is available right now. So if you want to learn more about how the code came into my inbox and see some gameplay itself, uh, check out the Let's Play. It's up. It's really good. I We had fun making it. I had fun editing it, and um, I, th I thought it turned out really, really well. So look for more Let's Play stuff. Uh, let's play type stuff in the future we have some other games we want to get to it's a type of content that we both are interested in creating and i thought this was a good starting point so there's your uh disclaimer i was provided a code by the publisher so feel free to take my opinions with a grain of salt with all that being said i actually really had a good time with this particular game it's a 40 dollars budget priced splatoon tony hawk skate mashup that is a whole lot of fun. The game has a single player story mode where you compete in different uh, different types of events over different levels. And that's definitely one of the positives. The levels are actually a pretty wide variety of different activities to do. Color Frenzy is the most Splatoon-like uh, mode in the game. In Splatoon, it's a third person game where you try to cover the battlefield with your color paint. And this is very similar. Every time you land a trick, uh, paint splatters out from the back of your scooter and splatters all over. The bigger the trick, the bigger the splash. Then basically the goal of the game is to have as much of your color as you possibly can, ideally the most color. In my case, it was like the fifth most color. This game also is playable in team mode, and when you're playing in the single player stuff, you play with six different people regardless of the situation. So you get, uh, if you're playing the team mode, you get two computer partners against three full computer partners. And each level has an easy, medium, or hard difficulty that you can play on. Splat Tag is a very simple game of tag. You either start as the chaser or as the survivor. Your goal as the survivor is to survive the two minutes, uh, the two minute timer. And your goal as the uh, tagger is to get as many people as possible. Crazy Crayons is a game mode where you ride around the level trying to collect crayons. They spawn randomly throughout the level and the first to five wins. And Trick Run is the most uh, Tony Hawk of all the game modes get big combos to score big points, highest score wins. So that one made the most sense to me as a person who grew up with Tony Hawk. You also face one-on-one -on -one challenges every time you get to uh, the top of a level. So there are seven levels in the game. Every time you level up, you have a one-on-one -on -one challenge. And that one-on-one -on -one challenge is the horse-like game, Scoot. Uh, ma make your best combo. If the other person doesn't match it, they get a letter. Pretty basic stuff. There's also a customization element to this game that I thought was really interesting. Uh, you can customize your helmet your pants and your shirts for your own unique character look but you can also customize the parts in your scooter the handles the uh, wheels and the deck and what was interesting about the scooter customization is each part adds or subtracts from five different stats your jump speed handling tricks and boost stats are all affected some positively some negatively depending on which part you're using parts unlock when you defeat the one-on-one -on -one uh, boss battles essentially they unlock parts in the store for you to go buy what's cool about that is not only do you get to customize the look of your character you also get to customize your scooter and have it fit the best way you play for me personally i like high jumping and i like uh good tricks so that's what i went for even if it meant sacrificing boost speed and handling it's cool that you can create a scooter to benefit or cater to the way that you play from a gameplay perspective i actually really struggled at the beginning um, i think the right stick does a little bit too much and this is where the skate comparison is going to kind of come into play the right stick in crayola scoot controls both the jumping and a large majority of the tricks, but those are two separate things. Whereas in Skate, it felt like one fluid motion helped you execute the ollie and the trick that you were doing. This one, it's you have to pull down and jump up and then move it right or left to do a bar spin. So 
instead of it being like up and to the right and you're going to do a bar spin or up and to the left and do a different type of trick, probably just a bar spin, the scooters don't have a ton of tricks to do. It can feel a little... It can feel like you're overloading the right stick in a weird way where it's not picking up all of the movements that you're doing. During the beginning of the game, I was actually desperate to just change the controls to uh, button controls that were more similar to Tony Hawk because I just, I was really struggling with that right stick, uh, right stick jumping. But over time, I got more used to it and started doing a lot better in the various modes. I think this is a great package. There's a wide variety of game modes. The levels are fun and interesting. It's bright, it's colorful, it's well priced at $40. It feels good. I like the customization options. And I just had a lot of fun playing this game, this arcadey scoot game that I didn't really know a whole lot about before I started playing. And when I started playing, I started to really, really enjoy myself and I had a great time with it. So thank you again so much for uh, sending over a code outright games that was very very nice of you uh, again if you want to watch the let's play check that out it's live now um yeah and enjoy cradle scoot it's a really good game i'd recommend it if you're into that sort of arcadey um like extreme sport type of game i had a really great time with it we have two limited edition items to briefly look at today both of them were brought to me by ashley uh, so thank you so much for these they're both um, pop vinyls, and the first one is a box lunch exclusive of Louise squirting, uh, Louise Belcher squirting ketchup and mustard, which is very cool. I have a bunch of these. She has bought me a ton of these, uh, Bob's Burgers pops. I think I own 12 of them at this point. Let's see. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Yeah. This is pop number 11 and pop number 12 from Bob's Burgers. So this is very cool. Uh, I like it. I didn't know it existed. She, uh, she got in contact with me and said, hey, I found two Bob's Burgers Pops that I know you don't have. Do you want me to get them for you? And I said, yes, please, if you want to. And she did. So she brought this over. Very cool. Louise Belcher. And the other is under the Pop Rides uh, line, I guess. I don't really know. But it's Espresso Trip Tina and the unicorn that she rides. She has her little uh, coffee cup hat, which is very cool. And this is... This is a convention, a summer convention exclusive that I thought was really cool and didn't even didn't even know it existed. So thank you so much, Ashley, for sending these over. I don't want to open them up because I don't want my smudgy fingers all over them, but I really appreciate it. There's a look at Tina on her beautiful unicorn, which we all know are real. And if you played Red Dead Redemption, you know that uh, unicorns fart rainbows. So uh, thank you very, very much. That's your limited edition items of the week we have our friendly notebook here with what is new this week uh on blu-ray this week arizona which is a movie i didn't know anything about but it stars danny mcbride so we looked up a trailer for it and that looks like a really good movie um i'd like to check that out sometime in the future benched is also out on uh blu-ray and this is a movie that stars garrett um what was his last name bert from um, raising hope Garrett Dillahunt, I believe is his name, and John C. McGinley from uh, Stan vs. Evil, and more importantly, more recognizably to me, um, not Office Space, but he is in that Scrubs. And that it's a looks like kind of a generic sports movie, but it looked good, and I like those two actors enough. It never made it here in theaters, so I didn't have an opportunity to catch it there. But Blu-ray is a good place to check that out. I think it's actually at Redbox as well. Finally on Blu-ray this week is the 20th anniversary limited edition Blu-ray 4K Ultra HD mega set for the Big Lebowski. And it contains a collectible bag, a ball pencil holder, a polishing cloth, and sweater packaging. And it actually looks pretty sweet. So for all you collectors out there, uh, feel free to go grab that. I think I know at least one person that will probably own that. Two of my most anticipated movies are hopefully out in theaters. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. I do worry that it's a bit of an Isle of Dogs situation where it'll release in some markets on Friday and then expand outwards after that. And those movies are Can You Ever Forgive Me and Mid-90s. Both of those I'm very excited for. I also saw that Beautiful Boy may be getting a wider release uh, this week as well. So we'll see. Hopefully one of those shows up this week. If not, uh, I am really screwed for content. Three games of note this week. NBA 2K Playgrounds 2 is out this uh, this week. I reviewed the first uh, NBA Playgrounds, which was not under the 2K banner earlier this year. I liked it and I thought it needed a little something extra to make it really special. felt like it was a good but not great game, and I'm curious to see what happens if they get a little bit of a bump from 2K, maybe get a little bit more money to 
polish, take more time and polish the game, see what kind of changes I can make. So I'm, I'm definitely curious about that. Lego DC Super Villains is out. Um, I like the Lego games. I think this will be fun. I think it's interesting that they went and just went with the DC villains and the heroes aren't really anywhere to be found. I'm sure they'll be in the game as playable characters, but the focus is on the villains, and I think that's very, very interesting. The last game was reviewed right on this very episode. Crayola Scoot is out today. As this video is posting today, you can go pick it up, so go check that out as well. So good week for games and hopefully movies, and even on Blu-ray. So good stuff all around. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of Week in Review. If you like the content, let me know down in the comments below what you're looking forward to this week. Hit that subscribe button so you know when I post new videos. Be sure to check out the Let's Play that went up yesterday uh, in Crayola Scoot with Ashley and myself. And there's no football this week because the Packers are on a bye. And be sure to check back every Tuesday for more Week in Review. See you next week.